On another occasion, Master Shingen talk about, talked about two different sorts of insight. There's world transcending insight, prajna, wisdom of emptiness. And then there's what he called worldly insight or mundane insight. Which one interests you the more? I suspect the first one. Mm. Yeah. Sounds dramatic, doesn't it? What's he pointing to there? Well, indeed, world transcending insight. In a sense, it changes our view of the world. If we really go deeply into the mind before thought and realise how we're creating the world in this sense, we're not creating the water droplets of the mist, I'm not saying that, but we're creating our experience of the mist. We really are doing that. And when you realise it in a deep way for your own experience, it can be lead to a radical shift in your understanding of the world and your relationship to it. Particularly when you see through the thought which creates the sense of self. Remember that one? Yeah. You see yourself arising. Seems strange to even talk about it that way, doesn't it? One practitioner once said to me in an interview, he could see the self selfing. It's like you can see thoughts arise and sort of coalesce, clump together into a sense of me, this is me, I'm here. A very sticky thought. But if you can be there even before that thought, the mind has calmed down and you're there without a sense of self and then you see a sense of self arising. Just that simple seeing that it can radically shift your relationship to self and to the world because you've noticed that you're not of the essence, permanent. You're a temporary manifestation of a few congealed thoughts. Hmm. So this type of insight it could be called the emptiness of self, radically shifts your worldview, its world transcending. And this is why this experience of seeing the nature of Kensho is talked about as an important experience. But there are traps here. It's an important experience because it's, in a sense, it's the... Uh, I hesitate to say the ultimate, but, you know, it cuts through the root of the most, from what nearly everybody is the most significant attachment, the attachment to self. There are other attachments to be cut through too, but for attachment to self seems to be the most sticky one, and therefore it's the most important one to cut through for nearly everyone. And this experience can cut through it for you. And so this gets talked about a lot as a very major event. And it can be both overplayed and underplayed. It's quite tricky. It would be underplaying it to say it's just another experience. Because it has significance. It has significance as a reference point to our understanding of the process of mind creating experience. And it also has significance because... Many of our obstructive habits, our habits of thinking, our habits of being, our ways of acting in the world, are rooted in self-concern, selfishness. And seeing the emptiness of self can cut through those because they just become pointless. You're protecting a self which sort of comes and goes anyway. Huh? Hmm. And it's not really the sort of thing that you thought it was. It's just sort of like a manifestation of thoughts. So what are you protecting? So an experience of no self can take away a lot of selfishness. 
So it's not to be underplayed in that sense, and this is why it's important. But it can also be overplayed. It can be overplayed in the sense of an assumption that it takes away all obstacles. You'll never again have another obstacle. And it gets overplayed that way in some traditions more than others. You could almost say as a sort of PR, as a motivational trick. You know, put ev every ounce of effort into Kensho. It's so important and it's so rewarding. But the problem is that Kensho doesn't cure all problems. It's a powerful insight and it probably does indeed release some problems or many obstacles depending on the person and their situation. But it doesn't cure everything. It's a brief experience, typically. Might be a second or two, or a minute or two, or an hour or two, or a few days. But it's not a lifelong shift. And during the time that you're in that state, some obstacles may be encountered and seen through, and others may not be challenged and may not be touched. And you may find, when you come out of that state, those obstacles are still very sticky, even though you know rationally that you can argue against them. Still, you're stuck to them. So, Kensho doesn't solve everything. So, overhyping it is not helpful. And indeed, sometimes people who've fallen for the hype, thrown themselves fully into practice, and experience something of it, then get disappointed and give up. Well, he didn't solve everything. He didn't live up to his billing. I give up this practice, it's a fake. Well, that's a shame, isn't it? So, underselling it's not quite right. But overselling it's not good either. So, notice whether you're leaning one way or the other in your own relationship to what enlightenment experience might mean. And actually, this leads us to the so-called worldly or mundane insight, which didn't sound so interesting, but actually is, is very interesting. I talked about small doubts in relation to obstacles you may encounter on the path. And then we move through a small obstacle of some sort, or maybe a large one. We move through a personal obstruction by seeing it a different way. We see we've been caught up in some story of the mind, maybe some story given to us by our culture or our family or our teachers, or maybe one we just worked out for ourselves. And we've believed it as a truth, but we've finally seen through it. You could say we've seen the mind creating the truth and we no longer fall for it. So this is an example of a worldly insight. It relates to our life in the world, to our way of being, our way of experiencing the world. It doesn't cut right through to the root of self. So it's not world transcending in that sense, but it's actually very important. It helps, it helps us to engage in the, with the world in a more real, present way. We're not stuck in a story and act, acting out a role given to us by the story. We're actually finding it possible to be ourselves in the world. We're finding ourselves probably somewhat freer, more open, more, more open-hearted, more flowing. So this is very important and very useful. But you might say, ah, oh, but it's not, it's not the whole thing, it's not the real thing. But can you see how it maybe relates to what you might call the real thing? In several, in several ways. First of all, as you've already discovered, when you're practicing, you come across these obstacles. They're in the way of you getting the real thing, so-called. So working through these is very useful. You could say preparatory work. You could say resolving uh, mundane obstacles of life 
It's part of the preparation work to make, give ourselves access to the mind before thought. If we're stuck on a thought, it's very hard to find the mind before thought. If we can dissolve that thought, then maybe just behind, around the corner, we're into mind before thought. This was what was blocking us. Or maybe there's 25 more to come yet, who knows? So there's a sense in which working through these obstacles is a preparatory work. It needs to be done. We need to clear the mind. We need to make space. There's a sense in which it's valuable in itself. It helps us in our lives and it also helps those around us who find us less fixed in our views. They find us more open, more present. So this practice is useful for others as well as for ourselves. We may be here practicing for selfish reasons to gain something for ourselves, but sort of on the sly, it's helping others as well. Oh, did you know that? Hmm. So it's very valuable in that sense. So these mundane insights are not to be sort of spurned as something minor and trivial. They're of the essence. You could also say, as well as being preparatory, they're also part of the fruit of practice. As I say, it's sort of the enlightenment experience itself can also involve multiple sort of resolutions of personal problems and issues and obstructions. And this is where these dramatic phrases like shattering the great doubt come from. Explosions. Because it might just be that you clearly see the mind before thought, and see the arising of self and understand the process. But it might also be a rather dramatic experience with many insights suddenly becoming clear into the way you are in the world and the way you've been relating to the world. It can be quite an emotional explosion as many releases all happen together. And that's where these dramatic descriptions come from. You can break through many obstacles all at once. It can be quite dramatic. So you could say these mundane insights are part of the world transcending insight. They're related to it. They're part of the experience. They relate to each other. But there's another important way in which they relate, which is also the work carries on after the enlightenment experience. As I indicated, the Kensho experience doesn't solve everything, not by any means. This is why it can be said to be the beginning of practice. You realize there's a lot more work to do you see very clearly against, so we say, a clear-minded background, a knowledge of the clear mind, you realise just how clouded the mind can be. And so the work carries on, the practice continues. So these seemingly sort of trivially named insights, mundane insights, are of the essence of the path before, during and after enlightenment. <laughs>